Talavalava, I am Montebetham. You are watching Once a Warrior. My guest in the wall today is Grant Ravelli. Ravs, how are you, my man? I'm great, mate. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really happy to be here today. Oh, I'm happy, trust me. So we can both be happy with our, our, our great haircuts that we both possess. Uh, mate, where are you and what's keeping you busy in terms of work? Mate, I'm based in Brisbane these days. I, I lead a, a risk business, risk consulting business. We concentrate on insurance broking. So uh, my area is from Darwin all the way through to northern New South Wales, Byron Bay and everything in between that, mate. So that keeps me nice and busy and I've got... Two kids, Lola, who is born in New Zealand, and, and Ari, as a ten-year-old, and um, yeah, happily married with with uh, with Lauren. So, yeah, those things keeping me busy these days, that's for sure. Some things never change. You're running the cutter. You're telling people what to do in certain areas. I love it, mate. Sixty-eight games in the jumper. Uh, a lot of memories to look back on. Let's take a look. When you see those memories, uh, what comes to mind? Oh, look, there's a lot of fun, fun memories in the in the Warriors jersey. I was really proud to be able to play for the club and represent the club, and yeah, had some great memories during my time there. We had a, we had a lot of success, and we had a great group of people as well. So a lot of fun memories, mate. So it's it's really it's uh, yeah, it's it's awesome to look back on those those uh, those highlights. That's for sure. Raz, relationships are important, mate, and, and we know that uh, Ivan was probably a big reason why you signed, but the relationship before you came to the Warriors, what was it like with Ivan? Yeah, look, Ivan is is the longest served coach that I've had in senior senior footy, so I ended up at the at the Roosters and Ivan was the, our reserve grade coach in 2003, so I was his um, first project as far as or part of his first project and you know, Ivan, he's, a, he's awkward at the best of times, but, you know, he came straight out of first grade. He ne had no experience, right? And um, luckily at the time, the Roosters had a, a lot of good support around. So Phil Gill spent a lot of time with our team and a lot of time with Ivan to help him develop and spent a couple of years under Ivan at the Roosters. We had success. We won a competition. You know, some of the attributes that he still has today that, that were there early on in the piece around really understanding the strengths of the players in the team and coaching around that rather than trying to force a game style or game model or structure on a team. So those things I think Ivan had brought with him, maybe from Daniel, maybe from some other coaches he had prior to that, but those are the things that make him a really good coach today and those are the things that I really enjoyed uh, about Ivan and playing under his guidance. And then obviously Ivan uh, was coming back to the Warriors and, and ultimately I followed him. I thought my future was going to be at the Roosters and that's the way it was planning to go. Uh, when, when the Warriors reached out, I was really surprised uh, at the interest and, you know, after some conversations with Kempe and then going and watching you guys play, I thought that would be a good move for me moving forward. So... You know, at the time, it was Kevin was the coach and Ivan was there as, as an assistant. And then, you know, as it played out, once I'd signed and um, when I was coming over at the back end of that season, uh, Ivan was at that stage the coach of the Warriors. Um, so I, I was coming over there with no preconceived ideas that I'd even play first grade, to be honest. Once it was very much a, uh, an opportunity for me to come and uh, come over there and, and realise my dream and play NRL, really. New club, uh, newbie as well in terms of um, a new country. Uh, early on, what was your, your, your memories of both the club and, and, and the place that is Auckland, New Zealand? We, we absolutely loved it. We, we would have stayed if we had the choice. I think the early memories for me was 
was around the culture and the culture of the club, but more more so the culture of of New Zealand and how proud uh, the the people there are of the you know Tongan cultures, Samoan cultures, and the Maori cultures as well. We we spent a lot of time you know integrating and understanding uh, the, those cultures and. Yeah, one of my fondest memories. We spent a week in, in the Mariah, or where it was from, where we stayed there. We we cooked, we we did the hungry, we did all that type of stuff in that community. It, it was unreal, mate. Those things, they, those things really stick with you outside of the the football memories, but those things really stick with you in terms of what I learned ar- around the New Zealand culture and how proud you guys of are of that. And it's certainly something I think from an Australian point of view that we can we can learn from as well. Mate, an Australian coming over to New Zealand, you know, being Bruce's and then also the Cowboys post, is, is there a way that the, the Kiwi or the New Zealand warrior um, prepares for the game that um, you can compare? Mate, funny story. 06, Webby and I'm pretty sure it was Toops. They used to get in the, get in the gym before the game and <laughs> pump up the gun. That's the kills for the girls. True girls. story. That's kills for the gills, they right? Get in there, you would pump up the guns before before the before the game. Um, no, in all seriousness, I think uh, we bloody train extremely hard at the Warriors. That's one thing that, that annoys me even to, to this day. Where you know, there's commentary, a bit of commentary around um, the Warriors' preparation and how we train. We we absolutely trained as hard as anyone else during that period of time. We we had uh, Craig Walker, who was from the Roosters. We had uh, Campo, who was from the Cowboys, who both teams were notorious for how hard they trained. And, mate, we trained hard, if not, you know, the same as those clubs during that time. So that was a bit of a frustration from a from a former player and a player at the time to, to, to around that commentary around, you know, the Warriors not preparing as, like, the Aussie teams. And I mean, that's just an absolute lie. We used to... We used to train our, our absolute butts off in that pre-season and the same in-season as well. Talk to me about your debut, the memories. Well, it's one of the proudest moments I've had in footy, really. We were playing against the Melbourne Storm. They played all the trial games and we played well and won most of our trial games and I was coming off the bench and playing that hooker role, uh, which wasn't completely foreign to me. But, uh, yeah, I was still surprised when Ivan uh, gave me the call and we sat down and had a conversation about it. Um, I, I think because I'd been in professional systems for a while, yeah, I was nervous, but I was uh, I was not as nervous and not unprepared for, for what was going to happen on the weekend. And if I reflect back on that, it was it was really an enjoyable week, except for I think the second last training session before we played, I uh, I got a I got a short ball off somebody, and then ribs come from the inside and belted me up under my rib, resulting in a couple of broken ribs uh, on the way through. So. Yeah, I played the first, I think, 15 and 16 games of my career with a couple of needles either side of the ribs, which is not unusual for, for players to play with, but um, something that, that I had to deal with. But the obvious uh, enormity of the occasion, yeah, I didn't feel, feel a drop of pain. It was, it was all about the experience and enjoying, you know, what was a lot of sacrifice in the years before that to be able to arrive at that moment. Your debut season, I mean, it was a great season. You, you came over, you started off the bench, but by the end of it, you were the starting seven. Oh, look, I think I think it was successful because I started from the bench in my debut, so I could get a real feel for first grade rather than... I think it would have been different if I debuted as the halfback, you know, off the back of Stacey leaving and those types of things. So, you know, I guess I've got to thank, thank Ivan for the foresight there or, or potentially the foresight there and, and Feeney to soften, soften that, that landing position for me. Uh, it gave me a really good understanding and appreciation of what goes on from a middle forward perspective, mate. So, so I've got a real respect for the things that I was asking, you know, the forwards to do through that process. And it gave me a really good understanding of what first grade NRL footy was about without having the pressure of running an NRL team off the back of one of the best players to ever play in that position. Name some of those players, and in particular, what about those players and how they played that really, you know, helped your game? Uh, you know, Webby was was a phenomenal player and had a huge contribution to the club there. So he was the fullback when I first started playing, and 
Uh, the thing about Webby that really surprised me, he's a really quiet guy off the field, but on the field he's just completely different, like constantly ripping into the opposition, um, even to the point him and Willie Mason were sledging each other from uh, across the defensive line at different times. So, uh, you know, what I learned from Webby, his anticipation uh, around supporting the forwards through the middle third of that field is something that, uh, one of my strengths, I felt, but I really learned a lot from Webby uh, off that. I think his anticipation on who was best to follow up at the right times uh, was something that, that helped me in future years. Um, you know, Jerome Riccardi, him and I were out mm-hmm. the halves combination towards the end of the season and someone that was so naturally gifted, but at the same time so tough of, around mm-hmm. how, how he played his footy. But, you know, I literally just had to give him the ball at the right times and he would do something with it. Um, those those guys are a big help. And then obviously Feeney at hooker. You know, Feeney had played halfback for a, a lot of first grade. He got a lot of experience. So um, he took a lot of pressure off Jerome and I as young halves during that time. Uh, you know, and then we had phenomenal leaders in, in Ruben Wiki and Steve and Pricey at that, that, that time. And, you know, while Rube's... Um, gave me the broken ribs. He really protected me, really protected me as a, as a forward. And, um, you know, there was, there was times there where Tony Carroll would, would pick me out of the line and, you know, with Rubes next to me, it was only for a, for a short amount of time during those games because Rubes, Rubes looked after me and was my protector. Now, you came to the club, had a, you know, a great contribution. Uh, so did two other players, Michael Luck, who's a club legend, 150 games, uh, but also um, George Gaddis, who was a bit of a character. Talk to me about those two. Did you know much of them before they came? Yeah, there was, there was a really good... There was a North Queensland connection, I suppose. And if you look back, I think it was probably deliberate, really. So... Uh, Nathan Fien was from the Cowboys. I knew Feeney from from when I first started as a as a professional, as a 17, 18 year old. You know, Michael Luck was in that group of players as well as Georgie Gaddis from that area. So uh, there was a real strong connection of some other players that, that, that the club brought in that had already played together or known each other. So yeah, I'd known Lucky for for years before that. We we were in the junior development programs together at the Cowboys. He's a year older than me, so um, one of the strengths of the Cowboys was that they get the, the kids in from from around the state to spend time together and go through those development things. So I know Lucky from, from that time. Uh, Georgie was a family friend of ours. He lived with my cousin, um, so we've known each other for a long time. Yes, Georgie is an absolute character. Um, he was the butt of a lot of jokes during that time. Uh, we had a we had a really good connection as a group there, and there were some larrikins in amongst it. And, and Georgie was central to a lot of pranks. Um, Michael Witt and yourself. There seems to be the combo when you say Michael Witt, you think Grant Ravelli, or Grant Ravelli, you think Michael Witt. Also coming to the team that year was Wade McKinnon. Uh, two wonderful contributors for the club. Very good. And you're smiling because you probably think he was a character too, Wade McKinnon. Wade, I was. <laughs> he was something else. Like, I think I think the thing that the, there'll be footage of it around uh, it was against the Tigers at Campbelltown. I, I think we still won the game, but for uh, uh, Wado got sent off, and I can't even remember what it was for. But Wado, it was like a Warriors fullback thing, you know. I think we, I said before Webby had a bit of a temper on him. Well, Wado was worse. He used to blow up absolutely deluxe at training and in the game, and just give the referee sprays all the time. And, I think it was back chat, and he got sent on. He got sent for ten, um, and he walked in the the sheds after the game at Campbelltown and started ripping off the shower heads and throwing them on the ground. And I'm pretty sure there's footage of it at the time because it got brought up in our post match uh, review of that game. But yeah, Wado, unbelievable player, but he was a lunatic at the same time. Woody is from Toowoomba, he's a year younger than me. I still can't stay in contact with him now. We struck up a really solid relationship from the first time we, we met each other. We're really talented footballer, could kick a goal like nobody else. Um, great passing, really good kicking game, tough player. The, the way he prepared, like, he was such a... Uh, consummate professional with the way about how he went about his preparation. You know, it was very meticulous and structured. Um, you know, he would he would polish his boots before every game. 
you know, everything was laid out perfectly. And he was the same with his preparation at training. You know, he was the person that was always kicking before training and then kicking after the game and um, always there around injury prevention and those types of things. So, you know, while Witty was, was an exceptionally talented player, there was a lot of hard work that went in behind that for Witty and those are the things that I think about um, with him. And then, you know, ultimately we had a really good com uh, combination at that time as well. I think we complemented each other. Uh, we had different strengths in our game and it seemed to work quite well. Yeah, you had some strengths in 2007 as well after backing up after 2006 because you, you shared top try score award with uh, Jerome Ropati and also Big Manu. In 07, our success was off the back of, of, uh, of imp implementation of a strategy just around half full. So if you think about the, the football field and how it's broken up, we had a lot of speed in that time, a lot of talented players, uh, and we did a lot of work on our high end speed. So half full is that zone between the 40 and 60 metre line, so the halfway part of the field. and. A lot of teams, and a lot of teams do it now, they're quite conservative through that period uh, part of the field. And if you think about the defensive line, it matches the attack at that stage of the field. So the, the defensive line is usually quite conservative as well. And, you know, Ivan came up with a bit of a game plan and a focus for us to attack at that part of the field. And we scored a lot of tries through that zone of the field during that year. And it caught a lot of teams off guard with how we did it. So. Um, you know, as a result of that, my job was to get them in a position and then I'd support up through the middle, mate, and um, people like Manu and um, Simon were, were making the breaks and it was my job to follow it up, so it resulted in a couple of tries, which is great. Three successful years for yourself, I think 24 games, 23 and, and 21, um, contributed hugely. For you, which was your favourite year and, and why do you think that was the, the year? Oh, geez, that's a, that's a hard one. All three years were... were equally satisfying for different reasons. There was a couple of challenges through, throughout that, which is uh, normal as well. But I think consistently 07 was probably the, probably the best. Uh, you know, 08, we really struggled at the start of the year. Uh, 06, we had the challenges around the points at the start of the year and we're still forming as a team. But I think 07, uh, over the course of the season, yeah, we had a little dip in form um, sort of after the first part of the year. but. Our footy was really consistent. We were clear on our strengths, as I said before, around that half full uh, footy. We were clear on the strengths of the team. We were clear on how we played our best footy. Um, and so I think, you know, that's probably the most the favourite for me, even though, you know, we were bungled out in the, the first two semi-finals of that year. But um, some of the some of the games we played throughout throughout the year and some of the wins we had throughout the year were extremely rewarding and yeah, look back on them, those things, those, mm. those, that year, those games um, fondly, that's for sure. I think there was a the game against the South when we were down by two tries with sort of four minutes to go and we come back and, and beat, beat, beat them on the buzzer. Uh, when he put a kick yeah, across for, for Skinny Burn, that year we played the Roosters and it was a 32 all draw over there. And, um, we beat the Broncos that year as well, and I'm pretty sure we beat most teams that year. And I think that was the start of the year where we had a bit of success with, with Melbourne and how we played them as well. So, right. yeah, they're great memories. I think that's where I sort of chose the 07 season as maybe the favourite. Yeah, consistent. You, I mean, you finished fourth on the ladder. Um, that's very consistent. But uh, unfortunately, through their final series, I mean, the home, home semi as well is disappointing. What, what do you put that down to, Ravs? It was really the Parramatta game. So it was a blackout there. It was amazing. Really good week. We prepared properly. We played within ourselves that game. So we, we didn't have a flamboyant buoyant style of footy by any stretch of the imagination. But if I look back on that game, we were a little bit clunky. We had a couple of try scoring opportunities where previously we were icing and executing those opportunities, whereas that game, we just we were just a little bit tired. And I think it was probably a case of us not playing finals footy for a period of time. And there was a couple of young blokes like myself and, and we that hadn't experienced NRL footy, footy before. And yeah, we were just a bit clumpy and just a bit tight. So we weren't our pre-flying selves. And as I said, we just didn't execute on some of those simple, simple opportunities at that time uh, was probably the reason. And when we got up to, to the Cowboys, they had an understrength team. I think we were 
we were thinking it was going to be a bit more of an easier assignment than what it was. And when we got out of the field, we scored the first two sets we had to put in, and that sort of justified in our mind that it was going to be an easy game. And after that point, we lost a couple of troops throughout the game, which is normal. Um, but the Cowboys capitalised that and really caught us off guard. And I think our soft mindset uh, resulted in us absolutely getting hammered that day, which was really disappointing. Um, you know, they've been used to a Jones in that number seven jumper. Um, and then it's uh, Ravelli, um, which is totally different. That relationship with Stace? Oh, man, I was lucky enough. We, we bought a place in, in Grey Lynn uh, right next door to Stace. I didn't know that at the time. And he was obviously over in France, but by the time he came back, I think it was my second or third season. So Ivan had a conversation with Stace about being being my mentor, and um, yeah, started off a bit of a, a relationship with Stace. As much as he is on the field, he's an absolute legend of a bloke off the field, and um, he was a really good sounding board for me um, because by that stage he'd come back, there was a bit of expectation around the team. We've had, we'd had some success prior to that in 06 and 07 uh, where we, we made the finals and made the top four. And naturally as a halfback, when that when that success happens, there, there's always a bit of weight of expectation. And um, for me personally, I struggle with the expectation uh, on my, myself. It wasn't ne necessarily the outside expectation, but... Um, you know, I had some goals of my own game and I, I probably struggled with that. And I think Stacey really helped me through that that period around, you know, taking a bit more pressure off myself. You know, I had other members in my team that I could rely on. Um, and he's, he's just one of those casual types of blokes that, that's really unassuming. And I think that was really good for me in terms of balancing that sort of, you know, self-expectation for me at that time. The tunnel, the drums. Try and describe that for the people at home because they love seeing it. It's been iconic, but for a player's, from a player's point of view. Yeah, we used to warm up out the back there. And, you know, the warm up, because it's removed from the atmosphere of what's happening in and around the field, I think that added to, to the environment once you were started to walk through the tunnel. So if you're at the end of the tunnel, you look down that tunnel and all you can see is sort of the light at the end of the tunnel and the crowd building behind that. And as we started to walk through, the, the drums are building. So it's, it's kind of one of those Hollywood moments where you've got the sound, you've got the drums building, and then you've got people like Ruben Wiki, who's 300 games in, who's an absolute legend, yahooing, and, you know, the other boys start yahooing, and you've got Manu and, like, these big intimidating blokes, you know, like they're really pumped up and starting to yell and scream and, yeah, like off the back of that, you start to run out there and then you, once you arrive at the end of the tunnel, that crowd noise just hits you with the drums, mate. It's awesome. And, you know, ACDC back in black's playing. Oh, take me back. Take me back. Ravs, once a warrior, always a warrior. Mate, thanks for, you know, making that number seven jersey yours and just leading the team around and, and for your service on the field. I'm really grateful that I was able to pull on the jersey and represent people like yourself that have played before us, mate. I, I um, am extremely grateful and very proud that I was able to, to pull on that, that black jersey during that time. So thank you very much. My name's Monty Beatham. I will see you next week for another episode of Once a Warrior. in for the Warriors. Ravelli's away, he crosses halfway, how did he do that? And he banks five points in style. Ravelli this time, he stepped straight through them, there was nothing happening. Ravelli will go through and Ravelli will win the football. The intercept, has Ravelli got the pace? Don't worry, Ravelli will have the pace. 